find out. There's a whole book written by his son in which a lot of these diagrams can be found. Uh, I didn't invent these diagrams, but I could have. Um, I did invent this one, which comes from a, a book about uh, the Third Reich and uh, the modernist architects who, who were associated with it. And so you know, doing wonderful little things like taking the swastika and punning with the F on fortune. And, but in essence, they are uh, using certain uh, attributes certain motifs, as I call them, and part of them are color recurrences, part of them are bar-like recurrences, part of them are black and white, part of them are uh, grid uh, edge alignment uh, things that are happening. Uh, for whatever uh, virtue or not, I am uh, marking the centers of these with a red dot. Um, we heard, we've been hearing lots of talk about, in science, about symmetry. Uh, at being an aspect of uh, beauty or aesthetics in science. I, I, I find that puzzling because if there's a, uh, if there is a canon in design, uh, and I think in art, it's that we play with broken symmetry. We, uh, we rarely use uh, strict static symmetry. Uh, and if we do, we make every effort to, to counteract it in some way. We don't want the pinball game to stop. We want it to keep going, so we contradict those kinds of attraction points. Uh, this is from a book cover by uh, Robin uh, Kinross, who's a publisher and, and very astute uh, design historian, and he designed his own cover here. And you're talking about counterpunch, which is the, the actual punch, the metal punch that punched out the... Uh, counter spaces, meaning the interior negative spaces in uh, metal type, and uh, he's talking about the evolution of that. But you can, and, and of course, metal type is backwards, just like rubber stamps. So he's alluding to that. He's playing cool greenish against warm orangish, and what he's doing all kinds of edge alignment stuff, and and uh, he's setting up a hierarchy. Uh, you know, this is the most important, and then maybe uh, this is the second in terms of contrast. And then the third, possibly hard, kind of hard to know because he's using all caps here. He's using all lowercase here. He comes down to all caps down here, but he, but he makes it very small and quite subtle in terms of his figure ground contrast. Uh, so it's that kind of uh, thing. It's not, it can't be done, I don't think, uh, in formula. Uh, we don't work with formulas uh, particularly, uh, but it's done uh, by struggling with it by trial and error, and then gradually over the years one becomes more and more adept at it, and a lot of that stuff becomes a kind of second nature. Uh, so, I mean, I could go on for ever. I have, you can imagine, since I teach this, and my students get to be really quite good at it, I think, um, I could go on forever with examples of it uh, there, and I, I could just walk out in the street, or I could turn on the TV, and I could see examples of it all over. Uh, I also could switch to verbal examples, as I did when I was a child. This is one of the things that is embedded in my mind from childhood that I used to love to repeat, along with many other poems. Uh, I didn't necessarily ask what they meant, though um, I don't know what this means. This is classified as nonsense. Uh, but uh, it's an old poem. We actually have the history of it. We can tell, we can trace back the printed versions of it that go back to the 16th, uh, or 1600s. And the thing that I realized at the time, I, I didn't know much more than end rhyme. I knew that these things were hanging together because of end rhyme. Hey, did a little, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon, the little dog laughs, he's such sports, dish ran away with a spoon. So, you know, spoon, spoon. So I started writing my own poetry at a very young age uh, using some of those devices. And also I sensed the rhythm, as I did in, in uh, you know, those Gene Autry songs. Rudolph the Red Dog. <laughs> and, um, so that's in here too, and those are another pattern. And, uh, and then I think later I became more cognizant of, of what's called alliteration or the rhyme that occurs between the beginnings of words like cat and cow and little and laugh, which I didn't mark here, and dog and dish and sea and such and sport and spoon. And you, it's not done symmetrically. If it's done symmetrically, then as I did when I was first writing it and a little kid and didn't know better, it's boring, it's too simple. And so as I grew older, I became aware of the fact that poet, poetic patterns are often much, much more uh, asymmetrical and complex. Th this is one that I love, and, I, and it's actually from the 1600s by Robert Herrick, 
But the interesting thing about it is that he's talking about the very thing that I'm talking about today. Uh, he's to it's called Delight and Disorder. And if you can follow the color coding that I'm using, um, you can see that he's doing the kinds of things that I'm talking about. But it reads so beautifully, and it so beautifully states this kind of uh, balance of connection, disconnection that I've been talking about. A sweet disorder in the dress kindles in clothes a wantonness, a lawn about the shoulders thrown into a fine distraction, an erring lace which here and there enthralls the crimson stomach air, a cuff neglectful and thereby rebands to flow confusedly, a winning wave deserving note in the tempestuous petticoat, a careless showstring in whose tie I see a wild civility. Do more bewitch me than when art is too precise in every part. So we're talking about leaving out. We're talking about causing the viewer a little bit of problem, right? Uh, and by that, upping the engagement. Um, the Gestaltists did that uh, in, in part uh, by emphasizing the fact that, that, that context is of such great importance. People have been talking about this at this, this conference, and uh, they were called holists as a result. Uh, and uh, not very long ago, uh, Jonathan Herfler in New York, a type, prominent type uh, designer, uh, designed this font called Gestalt. And if you look at any one of the letters, or especially some of them, you may not out of context, even realize that they are a letter. I mean, they're really very abstract. And uh, it's only when you put them together into word units that they then begin to read uh, reasonably well. And, you know, they wouldn't be used for text or paragraphs. They would be used for headlines for, for large uh, things, usually. Um, well, that was actually the most... Uh, innovative part of what the Gestaltists were talking about, and it's very important to, our, to ourselves as artists because uh, we don't think, we don't take things for what they are. We, we manipulate them. We know that they can become many, many, many different things in combination or in recombination or from a different point of view. All of those ideas have been coming up uh, in the talks that we've been having. This, for example, is one of the most famous um, Examples of this from the 1830s, discovered by a scientist, a chemist, a French chemist, uh, Michel Eugène Chevreul, and uh, he was actually in charge of the tapestries, the dyeing of the tapestries for the French palaces. So it was an important job, uh, and he was concerned about the consistency of the dye baths. Well, he found what appeared to be inconsistency. He would look at a tapestry, and maybe there would be uh, one area of blue, of a certain blue, that appeared to be certain color, but then he would look at another area and it was a supposedly the same dye bath, but it appeared to be a different blue. And uh, so he tracked it down uh, and by the way, he was in close contact with uh, some of the most prominent impressionists and was a great influence on them. But um, he found out that when you take a color, a patch of color, for example, this let's say this is a piece of paper of a certain blue paper and if you uh, if you pick it up and put it on a different context and a different colored background that it can appear to be a radically different color. Uh, and you can do the same with values. This is, these are all taken from the same gray piece of paper, but as they are placed on darker backgrounds or lighter backgrounds, then they change accordingly. There is a system to it. There's a, it's a contrast system. The contrast, um, the, the um, richness, intensity, of the um, of, of the elements increases as as we uh, as they become more contrasting. So if you put a um, a cool uh, in the background here, it, this blue would not seem to be so blue as it is now, uh, and, and so forth. This, this is all uh, still in print. You can still find all of this stuff with all the plates, and then uh, particularly you can find it because it was sort of. Uh, revitalized in the 1950s when Joseph Albers moved to Yale. Uh, Albers from the, was from the Bauhaus and Black Mountain College. He moved to Yale and he started teaching and doing his um, homage to the square paintings which uh, played on this very idea. Um, I, I have to uh, say that I, I think some of the examples of, of something of holes 
coming about from the arrangement of parts is pretty amazing. One of the things that the Gestalt has noticed is that you can take the same, you can take the notes, let's say, from a song like Happy Birthday, and you can, you can take those same notes, and of course you can rearrange them, and you get something which is not Happy Birthday at all. It has nothing to do with it. So the parts don't guarantee. It's, it's, it's the order. It's the, it's the spacing. It's the whatever, the intervals, as it was in the motion picture demonstration. And then they also discovered that you could take Happy Birthday, the notes from that, in one key, and then you could do Happy Birthday in another key, and maybe none of the notes in those two would be the same. None of the parts would be the same. Entirely different parts, and yet uh, instantly both would be recognizable as happy birthday. That kind of ghost-like um, uh, extra synergistic uh, consequence is really what they meant by the word gestalt, uh, that it was the whole, and that's what they meant by saying that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, this is one of the, I think, one of the more <laughs> amazing recent examples of this. Alan Fletcher is a re really interesting British designer, um, and he he took um, he took he, he went to the National Gallery. Of Art. He had had a job to design a poster for the National Gallery of Art. They were they were having a show of portraits from their collection, historic portraits, and he developed a portrait that did not exist before. That everybody instantly looked at and said, "That's Prince Philip." Oh, no, no, Prince Philip. <laughs> we were arguing yesterday. So just <laughs> yeah, Prince Charles. Oh, what do I have up there? Do I have, I have Prince Philip. Oh, boy. Well, I absolutely don't know my royalty. Uh, but, uh, yes, exactly. All my students have gone away. Um, but the, the, the interesting thing about it is that Prince Charles, there's no part of Prince Charles in there at all. And it's all been done uh, by finding these other things. Well, it's not so amazing. We could do it, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is Queen Elizabeth. John Paul. <laughs> no. anyway. I have to tell you, um, I'm not a scientist. I, I don't even know if I'm an artist, but I think I'm just a teacher. But um, one of the uh, things, uh, I work mostly by common sense and everyday experience. Um, so one of the things that I recall that was uh, an epiphany for me as an undergraduate was that in 1964, when I was a freshman, a new book came out. It was a I think it was like an 800-page book. I, I bought the, I had the little blue Dell edition, very thin paper. It was very intimidating. Um, and I had heard about the author, Arthur Kessler, because in humanities class, I had been required to read Darkness at Noon. Um, but I didn't realize that he also wrote nonfiction. And uh, I went to this book, and I, I could not, I could, there was no way I could read it from beginning to end. There was just no way I could. It was so intimidating. And so over the years, I would like read it this way and then read it that way and then read it this way and then that way. <laughs> and, um, and it just kind of grew with me. And, and then I would confirm it with other... Because I was reading at the time, uh, or a little bit later, I was reading Kuhn, I was reading uh, Foucault, I was reading uh, uh, other things that were, would later become part of uh, postmodernism, I suppose. But at the time, we, we had no sense of that was coming... Um, and I'm oversimplifying this terribly. Uh, I, I wish you would take a look at the book. Um, I found it uh, uh, one of the ways that I became uh, conveniently acquainted in a, in a kind of broad way in, in terms of the forest, not the trees, uh, with the sweep of, of uh, history and the evolution of ideas. Um, and, of, and of course it's flawed and, and it hasn't stood up exactly uh, as it might, but Damn, it stood up a lot better than lots of other things. And uh, one of the things, the kernel, I suppose you could say, is, maybe it's too cute, is that um, the creative process, and that's really what this was about, 
is um, an unlikely marriage of cabbages and kings of previously unrelated frames of reference or universes of discourse. I've heard that. Um, here at the conference. Whose union will solve the previously unsoluble problem. Um, this, I love this photograph of Kessler uh, <laughs> because uh, that's his dog, Savvy. And uh, I, I'm struck by it, so struck by it because we often hear that people's pets take on their owner's personalities or vice versa. And of course I can see that it's the, it's the hands. He doesn't have hands. <laughs> or, um, you know, the face even, or the, the way that the things are posed there. So, you know, interesting. And that's exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about very striking, unusual, unexpected comparisons and connections. And he got that phrase, of course, if you're familiar with Alice in Wonderland, it comes from the famous poem about the walrus and the carpenter. And the time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and chips and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot, and whether pigs have wings. Yes. And, you know, you can break it down like I was doing the others if you want. Uh, but uh, it's about what we in uh, studies of surrealism and Dada would call radical juxtaposition, you know, which is sometimes done by chance because you can't, it's hard to come up with these things uh, deliberately because you've been trained, like I said, as a child to move toward adult, deliberate adult categories and to learn how to do them correctly. And you're trying to break that. And I was always reminded of this uh, caricature from the 19th century by Philippon uh, when he was making fun of uh, Loire Bourgeois, the king of France, and uh, who had a, a, a head that people said was rather uh, overweight and shaped like a pear, and apparently uh, Le Poir in the French at the time was uh, uh, an idiom for uh, fat head, uh, pear head. And... Uh, so he did, uh, and evolution was in the air. Uh, so this was before uh, Darwin, though. Uh, evolution was in the air, and uh, so he started with a portrait, and then he showed how the king evolved into a bear head. Uh, and he was uh, arrested, by the way. Uh, it was just too popular. King got very upset. Arrested him, called him in, put him in jail, uh, interrogated him. Finally, they arrived at an agreement that he would go back to his newspaper and he would print an apology for doing this. And so he went back and he, he printed a tongue-in-cheek apology, but he set the type in the shape of a pear. <laughs> okay, um, and this is a point that I think is underlies what we were talking about. We, we had this kind of little debate that was, but it was important to me because uh, as a teacher, I think I'm more effective when I, use this notion or emphasize this notion that is that the word creativity is itself not literal, which is fine. Uh, we don't literally create. No human being makes something out of nothing. But we, uh, it always seems to occur, apparently, by recombining what already exists, whether they be parts or holes or whatever. He came up with, um, he was always trying to coin words, uh, and he came up with uh, the word bisociation, uh, which I think is fairly insightful, but it's, it's kind of ugly or something. I'm not sure if people, it hasn't been picked up very much. Um, but it's kind of interesting because it's a way of uh, distinguishing between that and associative uh, or association, um, normal kind of adult uh, sorting, which speaking very roughly, might be equated somewhat with intelligence, and bisociative, which is a sort of sort crossing. Um, and there I use that naughty word, creativity. Okay, but uh, you know, here are some examples of that kind of thing. I think in the 19th century, all of this would have been called wit, uh, and it didn't mean that it was funny, uh, because poetry isn't funny uh, necessarily. Uh, humor is funny. Science isn't funny all the time. Um, you know, so it's it's more that it, that it is kind of pattern pattern uh, rearrangement and, and surprise, uh, whatever. You know, I love this Henny Youngman thing. They crossed a mink with a gorilla. Uh, they got a nice coat, but the sleeves were too long. You know, or uh, you know, Sandberg. You know, there are 
tons of these that you can look for. And childhood, I do, I do a lot of reading of childhood memories and childhood mistakes because I love those because they're, they, they show the difference between uh, childhood categories and, and what, and then as you grow up, our Father Charles in heaven, Harold be thy name. Okay, well, I got this from, I didn't get this from Bruner, but I, I revised it from Bruner, a study of thinking. He was talking about categories, category formation. And so I would just ask you to look at this, and I'll give you about 10 minutes. Which of these things belong together? <laughs> well, I can give you 15, <laughs> because um, there are all sorts of answers. And some of them, by certain criteria, may have more legitimacy than others. But in fact, each one of them is, is different from every other in one way or another. And uh, it's a question of which attributes are you going to bring to the top of the hierarchy and which of those are going to be the, form the basis of your grouping system. And if you do it in one way, will um, all of these guys with the circles become scientists uh, and with all these guys with the squares become uh, artists or, you know, uh, are these um, cognitive psychologists? Are these geographers? Um, oh, how, how do you know? So, so if you ask me, was I kidding when I said I have some suspicions about about the categories of art and science. I have suspicion about any categories. And I think that, uh, who was it? Um, oh, oh, yes, last night we were talking about the um, no, don't break down the universe. Well, I don't, I don't agree with that at all. I think actually we should, in, if nothing else, we should instruct children to be more effective at, making, at learning the adult categories. Learning them like nobody ever learned them. Becoming so efficient at learning them. And at the same time, we should instruct them on breaking those categories and breaking them with the most effective uh, uh, devices that we can find. And there are devices. People have uh, discovered ways of uh, training people to do this. Um, so are there geniuses? Sure. Yeah. Uh, there are. But uh, meaning there are people who, who perhaps do this thing by, uh, quite more readily or something. Um, James, uh, William James certainly thought that. Um, and there are, there are people who just have a facility with it. I mean, I love this guy. Christopher Neiman uh, is a contemporary uh, illustrator. This was recently in print magazine. I can't, I can't think of a better example right now of somebody taking something so common as a pair of dice and harvesting it um, by playing with it and seeing all kinds of things. You know, it becomes pyramids. Uh, it becomes a, a lock and key kind of thing. It becomes a bowling ball. It becomes salt and pepper shakers. It becomes cheese. Um, so he just goes on and on and on. Uh, and then um, I don't know if you know this. You know, maybe you thought Aristotle was a little uh, uptight or something, but uh, uh, he's pretty smart. And I, I think that this is a particularly an interesting statement of his. Uh, and uh, here's uh, Neiman again, and now he's going a little bit further. <laughs> he's going up with uh, these wonderful little things, facial hair in Florida. Oh, that's great, huh? Uh, pu puberty sale at Target. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think one of the innovations of Kessler's book was that he was one of the first people to suggest that humor should be taken seriously. Uh, and uh, I think it was almost coincident with his book, or maybe it was, not one was before the other, that uh, there was the famous Getzel Jackson's uh, study of uh, the relationship between humor and creativity, and that uh, there was a positive correlation. Well, just to show you some other examples, you know, the figure ground and the, the uh, prey and the predator uh, combined, or. You know, this is the most wonderful <laughs> photograph from the uh, Art Nouveau period. Uh, Carl Blossfeld from uh, taking photographs of plants. These have all recently been, been republished in new books. But they, uh, you see the power of Art Nouveau as an, as an art style because it was really about human emotion. It was really kind of a plant-based expressionism to a great extent. 
to look at this plant and to, it's pretty hard not to see it as a, in an anthropometric way. Uh, or even Raymond Lowy, the opposite end, the Art Deco streamlined, but there is a kind of gesture in this that I think we can relate to in metaphorically, not in a way that we need to talk about, but we just need to feel. Uh, these are just other things, you know, um, misapplications or whatever. Ray Johnson, have you seen that film called uh, How to Draw a Bunny? Uh, John, he, he knew John Cage. You know, so I guess if you put your feet together, you get John Cage, and then you put them apart, you get two guys. It's kind of like the, it's kind of like the uh, Smith Smith brothers cough drops trade and mark. You know. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Ah, this is a restroom sign. For. Uh, And, and this, this is one of my favorite posters. It's um, by Abram Games, who was a British graphic design designer uh, during World War II. Did a lot of work for, uh, uh, for England. And uh, he's trying, I mean, they were, they were in danger of being uh, blockaded completely by, by Germany. And so uh, he's trying to convince people that they should grow their own food on this island rather than uh, depending on ships coming in because the ships were getting sunk. So. Um, I, I just find it amazing that he should be able to do this and with, such, with such brevity and such uh, elegance, uh, but turning a spade into a ship and ocean into land and whatever. I think you see that. Everything is uh, in a parallel. Now, this is broken symmetry. Um, I think that when I talk about this, I'm always uh, apprehensive that um, it will turn into being too explicit and, and that I will imply that the this process is an explicit conscious process that isn't too mysterious and I don't feel that way about it at all. My own work is quite intuitive but uh, I think it's quite rational and uh, this is a painting by an artist who's actually a Des Moines artist, uh, born in uh, Brooklyn though, grew up in Brooklyn I think, uh, Jules Kirschenbaum and uh, incredible painter. This is a painting of his wife if you need to know that but one of the things that he's doing with this painting is that he's uh, doing something very daring uh, that painters can appreciate. He's, he's breaking it down the center. He's establishing this incredibly strong center line. It's not exactly in the center, perhaps, but, but um, he's, and he's putting all kinds of densities over on one side, and he's putting all kinds of uh, emptiness over on the other side. And now he's, he's really gotten himself in trouble because one of the first governing rules is that you've got you to make it go together. It's got to be one stage play. It can't be two plays going on at the same time or something, whatever. And, and yet there's this wonderful tension as a result. So how does he do that? Well, he, he does it a couple of ways. Uh, one is that he does this little trick where he takes this plaster cast of his wife's face and puts it, puts it in exactly the same position uh, and close enough that we can make that uh, connection. And then he does another thing here where he's using a, an arc of hands. And some of them are human hands, some of them are uh, mannequin hands, whatever, but they seem to diminish as, as it goes up. And I think that if you were to, knowing him, if you were to apply a, uh, the, the arch that comes out of, uh, um, the arc that comes out of uh, the uh, proportional uh, harmony, uh, you know, the uh, golden rectangle, that it would be the, the, that spiral that he's, that he's probably using. Uh, and then he does other things, you know, like he, uh, he embeds uh, uh, he was very much into Japanese uh, isometric perspective, and uh, which which doesn't diminish, uh, you know, as, as distance increases, and so it has this kind of diamond uh, motif to it. And he's got that diamond motif in the tablecloth. He's got it in the chair, exactly, you know, exactly positioning it and so forth. He would, uh, he he's he's died. He he died of cancer uh, not too long ago. And and I don't, I, uh, knowing him, I don't think he would appreciate. Uh, probably his paintings being looked at this way. He wanted painting to be very mysterious. Uh, he was very much into the Kabbalah and, and some other things. And, and, uh, and we never saw eye to eye about that way because I always thought that people would benefit and society would benefit maybe uh, from uh, knowing more about these things. He was a wonderful man. Well, uh, Kessler said that, uh, that this process, however implicit or explicit it may be, uh, was more or less the same throughout uh, all of human experience. And he 
for whatever reason, divided that into three categories, art, science, and, or I guess we would say here, uh, humor, uh, uh, science, and art in that order. And then he listed uh, some of the uh, manifestations of that uh, in, you know, came up with controversial statements like, like this one right here. Um, but he also noted some differences in terms of people's reactions or the kinds of emotions involved in this kind of thing. And one of the things that he said is that, that as you go across this continuum, and he did see it as a continuum, there were self-assertive emotions involved in uh, humor, that uh, in mo much of humor it's disguised aggression, that you are putting yourself up, putting somebody else down, um, that sort of thing that uh, tickling, for example, comes from uh, displaced aggression. When you run up and start t you know, wiggling somebody's ribs, and, at this, and so they're, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're responding as if they're being attacked, but at the same time, their conscious mind is telling them, I'm not being attacked. <laughs> Hold off. And so they've got all this energy and kind of say, well, where does it go? <laughs> you know, instead of uh, knocking somebody out, I guess. Okay. And then self-transcendent, um, you know, mysticism stuff there. So, and, then, and then supposedly science uh, is uh, neutral. But he also thought that, thought that the reactions were different. And, and maybe he got too acute on this. I think actually someone suggested this to him, that our reaction to humor is, ha ha, you know, and uh, the stereotypic reaction to scientific discovery is, aha, Archimedes, uh, and, uh, and to art is, ah, oh, you know, that kind of thing. Anyway, yes, well, so much for that. So just to review, the three kinds of camouflage, uh, interesting stuff. Um, and, uh, and it's kind of interesting to me, and I haven't really worked this out entirely, and I don't know that I necessarily ever will, but I find it uh, being pragmatic. William James is certainly one of my great heroes. Um, and wanting to be primarily a teacher, not a theorist to theorize all. Uh, I, I find this operationally very beneficial uh, to that process. I don't know if it's true. Um, and in the meantime, I've also taken the metaphor of the marriage of cabbages and kings, and I've tried to expand it, maybe I shouldn't, into other kinds of marriage relationships, and to buy that to kind of make a typology of, uh, of kinds of creative process strategies. You often hear of making the strange familiar. That's really um, an old one. And... Uh, but there's the opposite of making the familiar strange. And, and that, these are ways of breaking up those categories that we learned uh, to use as adults. And then, of course, in Dada and Surrealism, as I said, uh, radical juxtaposition, simply putting things together by chance or by whim, not thinking about it, in fact, purposely not thinking about it, um, so forth. And common law bond, which uh, things, you know, after a time just seem to belong together because of their proximity. So I think that's a very complex um, subject. Uh, I, I know that there's tons of stuff out there, and there have been tons of things out there since Sputnik, because remember, all of this started with uh, uh, the two cultures became popular because, uh, uh, to a great extent because of, uh, we thought the Russians were going to get to the moon or something. I'm not sure before us. And uh, so there was tons of government funding for research of, of creativity. It's called, been called translogical thinking. It's been called lateral thinking. Uh, it's been called wit, and has been for a long time been called that. Uh, it's been called synectics, some interesting work by W.J.J. Gordon. And uh, Einstein called it combinatorial play. Um, divergent thinking as, ver as compared to convergent thinking. Um, Productive thinking, said Wertheimer. He did quite a bit of research in this area. Uh, and I like this planned incongruity, Kenneth Burke. I, uh, I really like that phrase. But I don't know what we want to call it, but I, I'm not sure that calling it is something that's essential as, as, as it is to do it and, and to teach others to do it. Uh, this is a little booklet I put together. I've been collecting things about this for many years, and I 
kind of called the best of them. And uh, this is uh, quotations from these sources. Um, since everyone's been so brash about selling their books, mine's right up there, $10 for that one. That includes tax. Um, oh, and I thought you would probably want to know how, what, what does my work look like? Because, you know, what do I do, little puns or something? Uh, no, not hardly ever, except in Craig's room. Um, these, are, these are done entirely on computer, and they actually were uh, motivated by uh, actually taking real books and cutting them up and making my hand uh, collaged books many years ago. But, but I decided at some point that why do them at all physically? Why don't I just do them in Photoshop, which is what I do. And, and I'm using things like, uh, well, I have to avoid copyright law, so uh, those little rocks are from the driveway. They're about this big, and they're very tiny, and you just put them on the flatbed scanner, and then you blow them up high definition or high resolution, and, uh, and then they can reproduce very large. But they're beautiful. And uh, you see that kind of root system there that's going across that? Well, you maybe don't, don't believe this, but that is the upside down backwards signature of band leader Glenn Miller. <laughs> huh. yeah. okay. Or this is another one, a little less bridge. These are actually just from last summer. I did about, uh, I think, uh, 30 of these or something, and I'll probably be going in a different direction now. Uh, whatever. And when I do graphic design, which I do often, I also do a lot of illustrations, I use the same principles, um, but I'm kind of addressing a different kind of problem to some extent, uh, trying to capture the spirit and feeling of the subject that I'm trying to, to play up. And to be even more blatant, <laughs> um, this is the... Art Design and Modern Clam Camouflage, which is here, and uh, that's just done very well. I, I self-publish all my books now. We have Bobolink books. Uh, my wife uh, is, is uh, an integral part of that, and uh, I'm only able to do that because I can write, I can edit, I can design, I can prepare stuff for press, and I can do everything about the book and just send it to the publishing company uh, in Michigan over the internet by dumping it into their FTP box and have it back in six weeks. Uh, so it's a pretty amazing process that that's happened. And then the other thing that makes it possible is, of course, you no longer really need a distributor. Uh, and the distributor wants 60% of the cover price. Um, well, <laughs> that's crazy. And so I tell Barnes & Noble, go do something else. Uh, you know, Amazon says, hey, can we, can, can we list it? Can we stock it? Uh, can, we, can we stock it on Amazon? No because then they're going to take 60%. So, but I'll list it in Amazon Marketplace, in which case they take 10%. <laughs> so that actually works quite well, doesn't it? Yeah. And then you book jobbers and that sort of thing. This is Cookbook, which surprisingly, I didn't, didn't know this, has quite a bit to do with what we've been talking about today because um, it has a lot to do with some friends of Picasso. And it's about uh, an Iowa-born painter, William Cook, who's actually born in my hometown, um, who became an expatriate. And he went to Paris, lived most of his adult life in Paris, um, knew Picasso and Brock and all these people, uh, was there. He was one of Stein's best friends. He taught her how to drive. And, um, and then when his father died, sold, and they sold all the farms uh, in Buchanan County, uh, he used the money to hire a young Le Corbusier to build his home in Paris which still stands. So I tracked all that down, found 200, no, 750 pages of letters between Stein and Cook in Yale at the, in the archives and uh, found uh, 14 paintings in farmhouses in Iowa uh, of his and letters and uh, all kinds of things. And so it was really quite an interesting experience. And then finally, if I can just end, uh, this is coming out soon. I've been working on this for 35 years, but this is the first and only book about uh, Adelbert Ames who was an American artist, psychologist, who built a psychology laboratory setups in the 40s and, well, 30s and 40s, really, including distorted rooms. Oh, that's not all. And, and then uh, you can pick up information about this. This is a, we're going to have a conference. It's, it's a 20 bucks total cost. 
uh, and uh, it's going to be at UNI. Uh, we're going to it's going to be an interdisciplinary art, science, everybody uh, one day conference on camouflage. So there's that. Thank you very much.